Yay. Uh, so, hi, my name is Kat. Um, I, my preferred title is documentarian. Um, uh, and that's, uh, I think, a debate for a completely different time. Let's, let's talk about that in, in another meetup. Um, but I think uh, people in charge of documentation do more than just writing. Um, so I'm playing a little with the title. Um, but my title has been technical writer. Um, and also head of documentation, ooh, fancy. Um, in my past uh, three jobs, I've been uh, in various scenarios uh, and various versions of being the only technical writer. Um, I don't have fancy slides showing like which jobs it were and so on. Um, so I'm just gonna dive straight in. <laughs> um, when I say the lone technical writer, I would think there are three scenarios where you can actually be the lone one. Um, you can either be the first of your kind, completely alone. Uh, there's been no technical writer or documentarian before you. Um, you can also be a, a single specialist in a feature team, kind of like a satellite. So there will be other writers in the company, but you're the only ones with that specific team or in that specific office. Or you can also be the last person standing. So there have been other writers, but you're the only one who's still there. And uh, I've been in all three of these situations. Uh, in my first job as a technical writer, uh, there were other writers when I joined uh, who you know, gradually trickled out and then suddenly I was last person left behind. Uh, in my second job, I was hired in to be a specialist within a feature team, but there was already um, quite a big documentation team in the organization. So I kind of had a dotted line to that team, but I was representing or not representing, but working on the documentation for that specific feature in that specific full stack team. Um, and also working kind of separately from the documentation team in general. And um, I've also been completely the first of my kind in my last job, which is why I got to also have the title head of documentation um, a little while in because the responsibility I had for establishing the discipline uh, was easier to do when you also had a title that had some clout so you could actually participate in discussions about budget and so on. Um, so these tips that I've compiled, uh, which uh, Shoko asked me to, to do this talk, um, she actually gave me a wide list of, of things that I can talk about, but specifically also mentioned the being the lone technical writer because uh, she knew that I have done that. <laughs> um, and uh, the uh, list of things or the tips that I'm about to share are some that I found are helpful in regardless of which scenario you're in um, of these three but also things that are really helpful to actually cycle back to so whenever there's a new project or just every once in a while to kind of evaluate um, yeah so I hope you can use them regardless of your situation um, and also that, that anyone here who's not just a lone writer <laughs> can also uh, find them hopefully useful Hopefully, I'm just going to take a deep breath because I'm mumbling. <laughs> onto the onto the we tips. Can relate. <laughs> good, good. So just to get started, I'm going to like like just give you the tips straight off the bat, and then I'm going to dive into them individually. Um, but the first is when you get started, assess the lay of the land, spend some time figuring out what's going on, find your allies within the company and find a way to balance long-term goals with short-term wins. Um, the fourth one, which is the hardest one to do, is be vocal about your limits in your job. And the fifth one is really use the community and resources that are available to you. So I'm gonna go through them one by one, and there are bells right outside, so I'm gonna mute myself <laughs> momentarily. This is just, this is going great. <laughs> Now I can't actually mute myself, so you're just going to have to live with uh, the ice cream truck outside. <laughs> um, so, um, yeah, so assess the lay of the land. So here's a scenario. You've, you've just started in a company, you're the first one of your kind, or, you know, you've had a team and they've disappeared. Um, a lot of stuff is going to land on your plate right now like suddenly there's a lot of documentation maybe people aren't even clear about what documentation actually means in the different scenarios but there might be a sentiment of like we now have this person to do it so that person will just do it um also if you've just been hired into a new position that 
like a team or a company that have never had a writer before, there's probably already a backlog of stuff for you to start. Like they've already curated a list of these are all the things that we would like you to improve or write. And, and a thing that I found the different scenarios I've been is that these things are usually stuff that actually been been curated in order to create a reason to get the headcount to hire you to begin with. So uh, it's not so much a backlog in the developer sense of this is all the future work we need you to do. It might actually be more of a list of technical debt that has accrued that is a reason for even having someone in the team who's not a developer. Um, also, you're going to have uh, new features coming out. Uh, that is a thing that never stops, <laughs> it just it never stops. Uh, so you have to be on track with that. Um, and if you're new, uh, you're also going to have to try and figure out what the uh, pipeline for documentation is for your authoring, for your gathering input, for your publishing. Um, you're going to have to assess the tooling. Um, and is there anything I'm missing? Yeah, uh, there might also be processes for including you uh, or they might not be there because they've never had you before. So all of these things are, are things where I would say spend your time actually assessing all of these. Give yourself a little while to just observe, feel, um, and also try and keep a lookout for low-hanging fruit. Is there anything where you can you can start having little successes and help the product in, in kind of minor ways that will actually get you going? Um, the last thing I wrote on there is style guide and I wrote a question mark because um, I've experienced both coming into a company that already had a massive style guide and uh, uh, where I just kind of had to you know start using it. Um, I've also experienced coming into a company that had a massive style guide that was written several years ago and therefore was outdated and also hard to find. Um, and I've experienced coming into a company where when I asked about the style guide they sent me the marketing term voice uh, that showed um, mentioned before but that wasn't really relevant for technical writing and so the reason I, I have a question mark for that is because I have a little spoiler at the end or a little tip uh, practically at the end regarding specifically style guide. I wanted to say when I talk about low-hanging fruit I have an example uh, from my last job where I started the week I started the release manager looked at me uh, my, on my fourth day and said, by the way, we're releasing next week. So if you want to get your hands stuck in, you can do the release notes, um, which, you know, great. I'm here to, to produce and, you know, it'll be a trial by fire. Um, and so that's what I did. I, I participated in the release process, um, finding out that there was, there, was, there was nothing. That was the last one was my, my first time truly being the first of my kind in the company, which meant that they had nothing set up for me. Um, the uh, quote-unquote documentation that had been done before by a marketeer, um, so stuff like release notes hadn't actually been part of it. That had just been compiled from a release manager from what he could suss out was in the code. Um, so I used that to actually write a long email to all of the dev leads, the head of quality assurance, the head of product, the head of product management, at the end of the release saying, these are the lists of things that are really good. These are the things where I actually see improvements, both for uh, the documentation, but also for quality assurance. And it was simple things where it helped the overall product that I pointed it out, but no one had really thought, sorry. It's stifling here, like it's so warm. And this is like a truck that just like drives around and sells ice cream. So it's really hot <laughs> and right now. <laughs> like excuse me. Um, okay, it stopped for a moment. Great. Um, so um, I, I sent this email to uh, all of the stakeholders um, with these things that I found. And it was stuff that actually helped the overall product. Um, so an example was that I wrote in my email, the question I've, I've, I've asked the most time was which version of the product is this in? Because it was a SharePoint based product. So it had SharePoint Modern and SharePoint Classic. And my most asked question to all of the developers were, is this modern or classic? Because the tagging system that they were using uh, in their um, task management system um, they had a tagging system where they wrote either modern or classic, but they hadn't actually been consistent about whether or not they used the tag for having been found in 
that version or having been fixed in that version. And so there are several things where you being there and doing your job will actually help the overall processes. And so that actually leads me to my next slide, which is find your allies. Um, you are going to have allies in the company. There are people or disciplines that are super happy to have someone that cares about documentation because they'll usually be the ones that will care about it as part of the quality of the product, like I just mentioned, or the ones that will be using it for their own job, or the ones that will be redirecting users towards it. So there'll also be the ones that want to not be bothered by questions that could have been answered by people just reading the docs. They will also love you. So a pro tip for finding your allies is that almost everyone is your ally. <laughs> um, QA, support, product management, designers, marketing, and engineers will probably all have an angle for why they would want to help you because good documentation can really help all of them for different reasons. As I just mentioned, like some of them will be using it themselves. Uh, some of them will be redirecting users towards a bit towards it. And the winning argument I've always had with engineers was the more I get to do my job and will help me do my job, time to do your job because people aren't bothering you. Um, so that's usually a winning argument as well. Um, so yeah, as you're getting the lay of the land, also try and find these allies and find out what their existing opinions are, or what their opinions are on the existing docs. I just found a detail of having switched two words around. Uh, but yeah, find out what they think about the existing doc suite, where they see issues and where they can help. They will also have some low hanging fruit for you. An example of this was in this first release that I just mentioned, I uh, actually started adding something as simple as support ticket IDs to bug fixes in the release notes which meant that on my second week, I already had an entire suite of um, support team members that loved me because suddenly they actually had a clear overview of which bugs had been fixed in the last release. So yeah, tip one and two are kind of simultaneous actions. Get the lay of the land and find your allies, build good relationships with them. That they will last your entire time there. Then, uh, you need to find a balance between long-term goals and short-term wins. Because while you're sussing the lay of the land, you'll have found some things that are big goals. Like I'm, in my notes, I've written capital B, capital G, big goals. Um, and they'll require changes to the development processes. It can be like you need documentation to be included in the scoping of products. Or uh, you need to get the company into a rhythm where developers actually write documentation input, or you might need new tooling. All of these things are really big, um, but you can achieve all of them with little steps. So I try to always dedicate the next feature release, the next sprint, the next page to a thing where I can include one improvement. So in the first release, I was mentioning, my improvement was I'm adding these ticket IDs because that's something that would be helpful. That's a low hanging fruit for a discipline. And then I wrote a list of, you know, to every stakeholder, these are all the things where I see we can do improvements. And then by the second release, there was another thing that we were trying to improve, which was the tagging. And then by the next release, we were trying to improve like how quickly I was included. So I didn't have to sit and do these notes right at the end and so on and so forth. So try to perform these little steps that will gradually get you to the big goal. Um, might kind of be a self-evident or commonsensical tip, but it's something I have to remind myself quite often when I'm in this situation. Um, yeah, so if you constantly focus on a little thing to be the next right thing, you'll build habits. Um, yeah, and speaking to that, I see that I wrote in my note here. Don't channel your focus into a style. Um, Microsoft style is the best in class and has a lot of clout. So if, you, if you're completely new and you've realized we don't have an internal style guide, you don't actually have to spend your time building one. Um, this is uh, a tip that comes directly from the Google development course I mentioned earlier, where they actually say, you know, don't bother, just use some of the, of the big ones um, that already exist. So the next tip, the fourth one, is the hardest one to do. And this slide is, can be a little raw because I'm gonna be skirting on mental health. 
because um, as I said earlier, a lot of stuff will land on your plate. Um, I've never been in a situation where I didn't kind of always have this feeling of there being something I wasn't able to deliver. Um, and this is not necessarily a failure in your part. Um, more likely, because you're the lone technical writer, no one else in the company actually knows uh, the scope of your workload and how much goes into it. So others might not go, might not go, might not know what goes into producing docs. Um, and also, as you become more settled into your position, the scope of your workload will increase. So, in some ways, documentation is kind of a black box where producing it is something that only the documentarians know really how to do and how much time will take and so on. Um, and so I've seen a lot of technical writers feel like they're not delivering. And I felt it myself and it can be really stressful and easy to internalize as being your own fault. Um, so one thing that I try to do wherever I am, regardless of whether I'm in a team or not, is be really open with my allies and um, and my lead in whichever setup I'm in about what the actual workload is, how long it will take to produce different things and asking for prioritization and being vocal about the limits to whether or not I can deliver something at a specific time or whether or not something should be included in my work and so on. Um, and I think that's the only way to really be able to, from an organizational perspective, alleviate some of that. If you're, uh, if you kind of feel like you're being stretched too thin, chances are you actually are. So be open and vocal with people and have them try and help and see if there's any organizational change that can be made. Do we need to improve a process so developers and subject matter experts help out more? Do we actually need a second writer? So on and so forth. So I just want to have that in there as a, as a very definite point. And so finally, and I have no idea for how, how long I've spoken for, like I might have speeded through this and I might have taken too long. Um, but the final thing is really use the community and the resources that are available to you. Um, you might already know this because you are in this meetup, but there's absolutely no reason to be alone, even when you are the lone technical writer. Um, there are a lot of us out here and we all want to help and learn from each other. Um, we have communities like the amazing Write the Docs community. There's also Take On. I had no idea about Bodhi until <laughs> I heard the presentation earlier, but there are so many communities um, that you should really participate in. So go to conferences, participate on Slack, read our articles, listen to podcasts available and reach out to people. Um, I've done it in waves myself. Sometimes I don't really participate. But every time I've showed up with a question or a point or something that I needed to discuss with a peer that wasn't available in my company because of being the lone writer, I've always been met with waves of appreciation and insight and camaraderie. So please, like, please make use of that and of us because we're all here together. That is the end of my talk. So does anyone have any questions? Uh, yes, we got some posted in Slack. Mm -hmm. uh, so first one, by asking your allies to contribute, did you use the docs like code approach? Um, that's a really good question. Um, I've used many different approaches. Um, you say the docs like code approach, um, but that can, takes many shapes and forms. Um, in my last job, I because I was in charge of establishing a process, I actually established one where people could contribute markdown files as part of their pull requests. And then I participated in pull request reviews and just reviewed the markdown files in that. Um, it can also be incredibly simple. In some companies, they actually still write, I need to not sound condescending, but in some companies, they, they write documentation in Word documents or in Google Docs. Um, so it, depends if you could the person asking the question if you could elaborate then i would love to go into more detail choco yeah so uh so what i meant is like because uh as you mentioned that um most of them are still engineers so i assume that they don't really want to use a different tool mm -hmm. than the coding editor mm -hmm. 
Yeah. So that's why I was thinking about the docs like Co. So in that in that approach, then they don't have to switch their platform. Yeah. So I um the one I was building at my last job, um, we were using docs like Co. with a markdown basis, where we were using um, one of the selling points for it was that they were able to author documentation in Visual Studio Code alongside with their own code, um, which was a huge, huge hit with the developers because they actually went from you know um, documentation being authored by a marketeer in um, in Word and then being published into WordPress and then being completely separate from the product to me bringing it into it actually living alongside the code. Um, but you're you're absolutely right. The 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 reasoning I've mostly heard is that they don't want to leave their tool. But to be honest, you can make them leave tools if you're <laughs> a, a, a kind enough ambassador that explains to them. Like it's 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 I think we as people are creatures of habit so we want to stay in tools that we know and so on but i think the primary thing when i ask my subject matter experts or my allies to contribute is i always tell them they don't have to worry about it being pretty um because that's my thing uh they just have to worry about it being correct so they can they can brain dump two pages of wall text if they want to into a document as long as i have something to go that is correct um, that's a really good starting point and it's a much better starting point than them saying we are releasing a feature here's the beta go click around um, so you know going from that to actually there being some input is a real improvement regardless of where that input is okay then we have the next question uh, what docs did you collaborate with uh, your allies um so i i um did the documentation for the universal render pipeline for unity technologies um which was really interesting that's the team where i was hired in as the single writer in the feature team two years into production of a new flagship feature um and you know having to document that from scratch and and also present it as an alternative to the existing core feature, but also kind of updating the existing core feature documentation uh, while producing this separately. And the reason I'm really using my hands right now is because it's hard to explain without having visual representation because it's all over the place, uh, which I think you can all relate to. <laughs> um, um, but yeah, so that was graphics documentation for graphics game developers. Um, and documentation on, on something that was moving decidedly away from what they already knew to, um, but, but being able to produce the same kind of results. So it was a really interesting um, challenge because we had to be like, we had to be able to tell people that this was incredibly familiar, they could rely on whichever mathematical and graphical and visual backgrounds that they had, but the tech was different. So they should be aware of these and these things. Um, and in that, I collaborated with um, like hardcore low level graphics engineers, um, front end engineers, digital artists, um, and uh, people that were hired to also to just like create beautiful graphics um, to collaborate with them on all the different levels of what you need to know when you're producing things. Um, and also I made sure to utilize the community that Unity had. So I actually also, um, uh, my, one of my product managers, one of my allies in the company, um, gave me uh, some names for like community moderators and so on that I could sanity check my documentation to and like send to in advance before releasing to, um, to the general public and so on. So, yeah. Cool. Um, more questions. How much should I focus on tooling? Yeah, so I think I wrote tooling somewhere in one of the sheets. Um, you don't have to focus on tooling too much to begin with. Um, I think it depends on the lay of the land. Um, which is because I have a background of, as a translator, it's a very translator thing to answer. It depends on the context. But um, <laughs> if you already have a pipeline for producing documentation that is sustainable, 
don't worry about it. When I entered Unity, there was already a, a, a workflow in which I could produce documentation. I just kind of had to do it. So I didn't have to put any effort into improving that. Uh, in my last place, uh, the, word, the word to WordPress thing wasn't really sustainable because we didn't have any source control. So there it became a really high focus. So I think the amount you need to focus on tooling really depends on what you find out during step one and two. Because um, you want to get into a system where you, if, like, if you're starting from scratch and you're the only one of your kind and there's never been someone like you, you want to get into a system where you're kind of future proofing. So by the time that there are two of you, like imagine you will get a second person at some point, you're going to need to establish a, a system or a situation where it will be so much easier for that person to start, right? So if tooling is a part of that, like if tooling is hindering you right now, then focus on it as one of your big goals. But if tooling isn't really, there are other things that are, are more um, frustrating for you, then, then have those be higher up your list. I have a question, uh, or actually two that are maybe related uh, to each other. Uh, so what is what do you think are the biggest benefits and biggest drawbacks of being a lone tech writer? And then what is your worst and best experience being a long tech writer? Those are really good questions and I'm just going to write them down. <laughs> biggest benefit and biggest drawback and best versus worst experiences. Okay, so I think the biggest benefit of being the lone technical writer is that you get to be in charge. Like that's that's the most easy way of saying it is is um, it's also the biggest drawback because uh, you can get lonely. That's why one of my points in this slide uh, or in this presentation is to really utilize the community because you're going to be in a situation where you don't have peers inside the company that you can you can um, ping pong with. Um, so that that's the biggest drawback um, that I felt. But it can also be the biggest benefit because sometimes you won't be bogged down by other people having decided. There's so many different ways of doing documentation, right? There's so many different ways of doing technical writing. There are so many different variations of docs like code. Um, and so one of the benefits of being the lone technical writer is that you get to decide on the, the workflow that works best for you. Um, and that is like a weird luxury uh, that you don't often get in the tech industry, I think, because most other disciplines will already have some kind of workflow established. Um, so that bit can be incredibly fun. Um, it can be incredibly rewarding, but it can also be incredibly, incredibly lonely. Um, it can also be super scary, right? Like Kelly was talking earlier about how suddenly he had so many options as the uh, the owner of this meeting, uh, so many ways of fucking it up. And uh, that's also one of the things when you're the only technical writer, you have so many ways as well. Like when you're saying you really need this for a process, you can also be fucking things up for the entire process of the company. So yeah, good and bad. Uh, <laughs> and my best and worst experiences? My best experience is the one I was talking about at Unity, um, where I was hired in to be the, the, the specialist in a team. Um, but I was hired as a contractor. And so after 10 months, I was centralized into the central documentation team, which was then my worst experience. Um, nothing bad about the documentation team. It was, it was amazing. They are amazing people. But it was uh, the, my best experience when I was working in that team. Uh, in the feature team as the specialist because that was the only time in my career I've experienced working as what's called a full stack team. So we had every possible um, discipline imaginable in the actual team or adjacent team. So when we were releasing product, we actually did so in a symbiotic manner. I've actually experienced to like, pressing submit on a pull request that had all the testing done 
all the unit tests written, all the automated tests written, all the documentation written, all, all documentation updated, you know, all of the designers that signed off on things and so on. Um, the API was documented and was beautiful and tested thoroughly. And we, we pressed submit at the same time and went up and had a beer together and then, you know, left the, the office in case something was burning. Like, we wanted to, like, let's just come back on Monday. And, but now is a celebration. And it was a really good experience of actually everyone delivering at the same time as a team. Um, but it was also hard later when I centralized and I, I wasn't working with that team specifically anymore, but several different teams, because it really put me in a situation where I felt like I wasn't delivering anything um, on time. Um, and so I was still technically the writer for that team, but because there are subtle changes, um, to, to like the reporting lines and the expectance, what was expected from me and so on. It was one of those times where it's really hard because I was actually feeling like I'm, I'm not able to provide that experience for anyone. Full stop. Thank you. Uh, we have more questions though. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, so we have an ex-Unity person uh in the meetup who's asking what was this feature and what <laughs> it was the universal <laughs> render pipeline uh the artist previously known as um the lightweight render pipeline and it was the graphics team in copenhagen he's typing something let's see yeah he's just wrote yeah and a smiley face <laughs> <laughs> but i skipped one question uh so if there's already a docs team, but I'm the lone writer in a featured team, how does that work? How do I be both alone and part of a team? Yeah, good question. So the thing that was amazing to me about being the lone writer in the team, and then there also still being a docs team, was that there are peers that you can talk to and establish processes. So. I had the ability, it puts you in a situation where you're able to focus on helping your specific team that you're working in, um, helping that team establish documentation processes in their workflow. And uh, sorry, I'm just gonna change the image so I'm not just looking at myself, because um, that's confusing. Um, yeah, so that puts you in a situation where you can help a specific team established processes and it kind of takes the weight off of having to do it for an entire company because you already have a central team that's doing it for an entire company. Um, so that's a really good thing. Uh, it requires a lot of back and forth thing with the central documentation team because um, you will have to adhere to uh, style guide decisions, to general publishing, publishing decisions and so on made by the documentation team. So it requires a lot of communication, which I think is the general uh, point of my entire presentation is do a lot of communication with everyone all the time like you cannot over communicate thank you uh, i don't see any more questions so james wanted to talk a bit about being the only writer at i settle yeah i mean you've actually covered a lot of the the experience I've had, I, I I was brought in on a short term contract initially to sort out um, compliance documentation for specifically for an audit. It, it they'd been audited and the documentation was uh, criticised in the audit report. So they suddenly said, "Right, well, we need someone to do that." Um, but then. I did a for that. I did a very very quick fix because previously they'd used um, Confluence and we're just pumping PDFs straight out. But we were talking about 120 pages of documentation and it came out unformatted, not branded. And so I initially did a quick fix for uh, and put them all into just word individual word documents, um, which got them through the audit and but now uh, i've decided to bring in a tool and we've gone with because i have i have one other person i work with who works one day a week uh, and we decided together that we would bring in madcap flare because i wanted to have an actual usable tool because i'm not entirely sure how long 
I'll be there. I'm not sure what their plans are for the documentation. And at least with that, it felt like I could at least leave it to the team and show them where everything is. And it would probably be able to be continued. Um, but uh, yeah, so, but I agree with a lot of, of what you've said. About being, I, I've often been myself yeah, and I quite like the freedom of, like you said, but, but I think one of the hardest things is people don't really understand that there's so many different types of doc documentation and you, the one person they have might not be particularly good at one yeah. part of that. Yeah. Uh, I, I have no real experience with API uh, documentation, but I'm doing it at, at IZEL because I'm the person who does documentation. But it's fun. Yeah. It's it's interesting. But I don't think I think developers they have uh, it's it, we tend to be oh you're a tech writer whereas developers they're you know are they front end back end uh, yeah we we maybe need to come up with some more niched niched roles oh more roles <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah more titles no but I think you're absolutely right and and the thing that's actually a good point that I could have included in my presentation as well. Um, is that the word documentation means different things and it's it's when I joined um, my, in, my, in my last company which was actually three proprietary companies you know it's you know one hyper growth company that had come in and eaten two other companies uh, and but the original feature team still existed and they were trying to consolidate everything and so I actually spent about a month finding my allies but also finding out what they meant about documentation because it meant so many things to different people, right? So the, there was an engineering lead who was desperately crying out for process documentation and for feature specs because, you know, he was in a frustrating situation where handovers were a thing that was actually like a whiteboard uh, picture snapshot that was sent to him and go, can you develop this? So he wanted something that in my mind was not documentation at all. Like it wasn't what I was thinking. But it was also a really heavily IT growth slash consultancy company. Um, of them were so you had professional services and customer success managers, and to them, documentation was about project implementation. What does this look like specifically on the client side? And then you had marketeers and also customer success managers who thought that documentation was help guides. Um, specific cases, specific how-to cases. You also had support that felt that, you know, it was, you know, bug fixes and specific troubleshooting. And then you also had developers in these seven different um, uh, development teams that meant, you know, you know, API documentation because they had to start to plug into each other's products without really understanding them. And so there were so many calls back and forth of actually subject matter experts spending each other's time having conversations every time they ran into something. Mm -hmm. And so that's part of what I mean when I say get the lay of the land and also find your allies and find out what documentation means to them is the thing that might have gotten you hired. Like the thing that got me hired to that position originally was they wanted someone to be in charge of updating the WordPress site and after a month I came in and said I'm gonna abolish it like I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna move us into a completely different system because like we need something that's scalable across the entire company which this isn't um, so yeah find out what documentation means and and where you can have like where your efforts would be valuable and where you can direct them and what you have time to do because um, in that specific company, you know, I was, I really felt for our internal developers, but it was not going to be my first priority to have them look at API documentation to begin with, because one, as you said, James, like, I'm not good at that either. Uh, I, I'm, I'm decent, but I mean, honestly, I think it would probably be better. I could just, you know, review their, their, their phrasing and their language. Um, but also, we had other, like, gaps that needed to be filled first. So I think that needs to be the last word for this talk. We yes. Are, I saw that Ola, you posted more questions uh, in the Slack, but we, let's take that in the breakout rooms later to discuss that. Uh, so thank you so much, Kat. It was a really, really good talk. Uh, I think everybody uh, agrees on that. Uh, so let's take five minutes. That means that we're five minutes late. Uh, so let's start up, start up again uh, 20 past. 
uh, so get a beer, water, uh, go pee, whatever you want. <laughs>